Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us. With that. We have uh, a lot more people actually, and I'll, with that in mind, I'll step over here. We have a lot more people uh, watching us via Zoom than we do in person here. So we, we're experimenting with this hybrid approach to try to please everyone and walk in kind of a fine line, bit of a tightrope trying to pull it off, but uh, hopefully so far so good. Uh, we're delighted to have Sean with us for a program tonight. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, first, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the uh, program next month will be on uh, May 16th, I believe it is, the second, third Tuesday of the month, uh, featuring a remarkable young Mainer. Uh, and her name is <laughs> doing a program on the, uh, see, I, I got a little discombobulated by uh, all this tech setup. And our tech person is in the Arctic tonight. So <laughs> she was no help at all. Uh, but I, I will come back to you with that information. The program next month is on the forests of Maine and enabling them to help preserve birds. And it's going to be a great program. Complete information is available on our website and Facebook page. And also later this month, we have a workshop coming up that I think there are still a few spots available for. It's the uh, Birding by Ear workshop with Dan Gardoki. Is it Dan, is it on the 29th, I believe? Uh, Saturday, the 29th of April. Uh, there may still be a few spots available if you're interested. Again, full information on our website. Uh, but on to tonight's program. Uh, Sean Jalbert from uh, Native Haunts in uh, our neighboring town of Alfred is someone who is absolutely passionate about native plants and ensuring their uh, employment in our environment. Uh, not only is he passionate, but he's also extremely knowledgeable, which is an excellent combination. And we're so delighted to have him here with us tonight to talk to us about native plants and how it can heal and improve our landscapes. So, yes. Anna Siegel. Anna Siegel, thank you, is the name of the remarkable young woman <laughs> who will be our presenter next month. So, Sorry, uh, no problem whatsoever. So, Sean, let me turn it over to you. Thanks thank you, for your Bill. patience. Yeah, certainly. So, always. But you'll need to, I'm sorry, you'll need to stand over here to oh, okay. have yourself be visible. Oh, superb. So thank you for the kind words and the introduction, Bill. So tonight we're going to be kind of going over a, a good dose of Doug Calamyism, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. And, uh, his works have been very influential in my uh, continued development, speaking of native plants and uh, figuring out how to integrate them into the landscape and, and how to make them work and, uh, in terms of, of enriching our landscapes. And you know, oftentimes we may not realize it, but our landscapes are, are almost sickly and kind of ailing. So that's the theme of tonight's uh, presentation is uh, using native plants for uh, kind of ailing landscapes and native plant medicine. So just so you don't have to write like mad folks in here, I put all of my presentations in PDF format on my website within a day or so. And uh, that way you can reference it. And it doesn't have all the uh, kind of the slick movements that the typical presentation does, but at least there's enough information there. So if you want to uh, look at one of the pictures again or, or review some of the information that's on the slides, you can do that at your leisure in your living room and uh, a little bit more at ease. So Bill went over more or less what I do at Native Haunts. And um, essentially I'm, I'm many things. I wear a lot of different hats and I can't really be pigeonholed into it one particular category, but uh, ultimately at the end of the day, I'm a native plant advocate. And I do that in a number of different ways by uh, coming to places like this and talking with folks. I can bend their ear for an hour or so about native plants. And uh, you know, I also sell uh, you know, native plants themselves and trees and shrubs and uh, organically grown perennials and uh, consulting services. And uh, it's kind of rare to have just a 
singularly devoted native plant nursery, uh, especially in this area. So I'm glad to be able to offer those services to the folks. I started probably about 20 or 22 years ago. And I often tell the story when I first started, it was very discouraging because I literally couldn't give native plants away. And at one point after growing this nice crop of them, I really did just try to simply give them away. And there are no takers even at that point. So it was kind of a hard way to start, but more or less I hung in there. And as the years went on and uh, you know, within the last five or 10 years or so, things have really picked up. And especially within the last three years, I guess it's, if you can go so far as to say one of the gifts from the pandemic uh, was increased awareness of, of native plants and getting outside and uh, you know other things that we can be doing with our time instead of rushing around going all over the place. So it was kind of a, uh, a, you know, a happy time and amongst a, a lot of challenges. So that worked out quite well for me. So trying not to be too pessimistic because I like to infuse a, a fair amount of optimism and presentations here. So uh, we're gonna figure out what we can do with our landscapes and not to be too, uh, having too much enforcement here, but we really do need to do better with our landscapes. And uh, we'll have several examples of here of, uh, you know, do this, don't do that sort of thing. So, so rather strong language here, unacceptable, but really it is <laughs> when you go to take a look at it. Uh, you know, we have the, the classic American lawn here with artfully decorated and bordered with hostas. I really had to give the guy credit. And uh, to give him even more credit, this particular customer eventually went on and, and uh, really made an aggressive effort to install native plants in his yard and uh, kind of disassembling this rather meticulous work that he did with, with the border work with the um, you know, ecologically inert hostas and uh, you know, the lawn that's just really kind of taking up space and not doing a heck of a lot. So, uh, and we all know how resource intensive lawns are. Uh, the obvious things like the amount of water they take, I think I read somewhere today that they take something like one to two inches of water per week or uh, you know, maybe even more during the growing season. So especially in some of the more parched areas now that we're seeing and you know, rainfall seems to be unpredictable. And we never really know what we're gonna get there. So you know, we're, we're pouring all kinds of water on these lawns and, and really for what, it's not like they serve much of an ecological value. I think they're more of a, almost like a safety blanket of sorts. So. So we kind of go to the opposite extreme here, and this is a really splendid example of what I often jokingly say is what you can do by doing nothing. And by that, I mean, this particular area here was on the edge of an athletic field in Kittery. And it was, I can only assume it must've been done intentionally because there was just a splendid uh, growth of native plants. And as you can see here, I'll step aside for just, just a moment and see in the background, that nefarious plant, uh, purple loosestrife is growing in amongst you know, this beautiful uh, growth of natives. We have some uh, Joe pie weed, and of course, the seemingly ever-present goldenrods. And uh, I was supposed to be watching my son playing soccer, but of course, I was looking at the plants like I always do. So I tried to split the time evenly between both. But it was really remarkable the amount of pollinator activity in this uh, particular uh, kind of set aside area. And uh, in yes, even on the purple loosestrife. So even though they're highly invasive and uh, you know, they're kind of almost disassembling ecosystems with their invasions. They do at least provide some services in the form of uh, being what seemed to be a pretty attractive pollinator plant. So one of my favorite places to go is the Mount Cuba Center down in Delaware. And it's right on the Pennsylvania border. Of course, Delaware isn't too big anyway. It seems like you could run across the state, but uh, really splendid uh, kind of the typical manor garden that we see down in that greater Philadelphia area known as you know, America's gardening uh, paradise, essentially. But uh, in the last few years that I visited, I visited probably about like 10 or 15 years ago, and then just again last summer, and they've made just tremendous strides at showcasing techniques on basically how to use native plants in your landscape. And again, kind of what to do, do this, don't do that sort of thing. And what I really like about this picture, and it was just kind of an afterthought, it was a horribly steamy, sultry day down there. And you know, my son was kind of crying and whining and the other one really didn't want to be there either. So I was just kind of walking out of the garden. I just kind of took this quick picture. And as I was looking back, I realized how critical this picture was because it basically shows the kind of like the complete inversion of how we typically see our landscape. So, you know, we have these lushly planted multi-layered 
uh, plantings on either side of this grass walkway. When you kind of think about it, if we went back several pictures, you know, it's kind of the inverse of what that first picture was with the, you know, with the lawn and the hostas. Uh, so this is what the trend is now, is going towards trying to minimize lawn square footage. And, you know, we, we can have our cake and eat it too. If we're good, going to have our lawn, kind of use it, kind of walking on it, if you will, all over it, but using it as a pathway, it makes a really good pathway and it keeps it down. It, it basically cuts down substantially on those resource intensive, um, you know, chemicals and other products and precious rain and, and such that we would normally have to use. So this is kind of splendidly showcases that. Another picture at Mount Cuba, uh, what I particularly like about this one, again, this picture was kind of taken unintentionally, but it was a, a happy, not really a mistake, but coincidence, if you will. This does an excellent job at showing uh, the, the, the layering that we typically come across in a healthy landscape. Uh, off to the left there, we have uh, you know, the tree portion, kind of a tree shrub uh, layer, and then below that, kind of a, a shrub layer. And then you know, we get down into our perennials and our so-called forbs. And uh, that layer itself is particularly rich. And uh, you know, it highlights the use of ferns, which I don't think we talk about quite enough in our planted landscapes. And uh, I've learned quite a bit about ferns in the last several years. I've done some presentations on those. And uh, you know, as plant folks and gardeners and biologists and such, we can't help but wonder like, to the ferns, it's like, what are you doing in the landscape? You look pretty, it makes for some nice habitat perhaps. Uh, you know, usually we associate ferns with kind of shady, uh, moist areas, but what's going on there with the fern? So come to find out there's a number of studies that have been done to, that show ferns lock up a disproportionate amount of key nutrients into their tissues. I think the one study that I read about was uh, looking at phosphorus and uh, something like 30 to 40% of the particular, I think this was in the Harvard uh, forest, uh, you know, that usually acts as kind of like an outside laboratory. They found that, you know, this phosphorus lock up in ferns. So by doing this, ferns were kind of able to almost control the, the, the successional dynamics of the forest in a way. Uh, so I found that tremendously interesting. And there are several other papers too that um, point that out and um, mostly for tropical areas where ferns are most common, but you know, also in the temperate areas that we live in too. So uh, don't forget your ferns when you're planting your landscape. And also, we have some sedges uh, kind of on the bottom side there as well. And I always feel like sedges kind of in this area too, uh, a kind of a forgotten landscape plant. And you know, if you've ever had any time looking at sedges, they're the so-called inflorescence or the flowering stalk as it is comes in just a mind boggling array of geometric designs. Uh, you can practically have a, an art book published just on those kind of inflorescences. They're, they're so special. So uh, again, something that we could certainly integrate into our landscapes as well. And uh, something that's kind of lacking in the horticultural trade. There's a few uh, sedges that are available, but there definitely could be more. So never have enough native plants, right? <laughs> So it makes sense, wildlife friendly landscapes start with native plants. And of course, those of us who have read Doug Tallamy, we understand this pretty well. And uh, just Doug, just, I call him St. Tallamy, I guess in my, in my twisted little world, just because of uh, the, the gift that he's given us on being able to make that correlation between uh, the importance of uh, native plants to native insects. And then of course, almost forms like a triad of sorts, those native insects have on our, our, our bird populations. And uh, you know, we know that something like 90% of our uh, migratory birds and, and, and resident birds for that matter, rely on that insect form of protein to raise their young and to sustain themselves so they can do their activities too. So, uh, you know, really made that equation between the two uh, so obvious. So I'm a sucker for the viburnums and some other groups of plants as we'll go into here. And what I really like about a lot of these groups of plants, especially with the viburnums, we have five species that are readily accessible and viewable in landscapes. A lot of these here, uh, like the arrowwood viburnum on the left with the, the large blue berries, uh, you know, we find that a lot on like uh, power line right of ways where we have a kind of a nice variation. We have that openness, but yet we can have some moisture with some residual wetlands that might be there. Wonderful uh, bird uh, plant in terms of the, both the insects that it, it feeds with the leaves and also uh, you know, with the berries, I collect seeds. So I, I'm always running these experiments. I don't really intend to run, but I see, okay, I, you know, I know when it flowers, so usually, 
anywhere from uh, you know, four to five weeks later, I should start checking for seed. And with a lot of these species, you have to check for seed early because it's certainly first come first serve. And it's almost like a, a kind of a pillaging sort of, of, of situation because as soon as those uh, fruits are ripe, they're gone within days. And maybe at the end of the week, you might be able to find a few scraps that you could try to propagate. But uh, so that's a really interesting with the arrowwood viburnum. And then another favorite that's often found in a similar habitat is a uh, wild raisin. Uh, that's a kind of an all-American plant, if you will. It's really spectacular the way the berries go through a, a three-part maturing process. So when they start out, they're kind of whitish with a pink blush. And this is kind of like partway through the second stage where uh, they turn kind of full pink and sometimes reddish. And then by the time all is said and done, they really do look like a raisin that's sticking on the, the branches. And they're kind of a, this nice dark purpley blue color. And again, the birds just love them. So viburnums are just a spectacular species uh, or group of, of plants in general. And then the kind of lesser known, perhaps maple leaf viburnum in the upper right corner there. So uh, that's more of a, a forest dweller. I and mean, sometimes it will sneak out a little bit towards the edge on some of these right aways, but typically we find it associated with uh, denser shade and uh, upland acidic soil. So, and we have several other species here that I didn't list, including hobble bush, uh, which I, purposely left out due to the fact that it's really hard to grow and propagate and make happy. So uh, whenever I'm doing my presentations and uh, I don't want to do what folks did 20 years ago, it's like, these are all these wonderful native plants that you could put in your garden, but good luck trying to find them. So I like to try to highlight the plants that I talk about. You can actually buy from folks such as myself or from other nurseries and uh, you know, Garden in the Woods down in uh, Framingham, Massachusetts. It's a wonderful uh, place to go in the Sami Farm out in Western Massachusetts. And uh, there's more and more of us popping up now that are growing uh, native plants. So uh, they're, they're getting a little bit easier to find on some of these. So the next group of shrubs that I really love are the dogwoods. And uh, again, we have, uh, I think there's like five, at least five uh, species of, of dogwoods that are, again, fairly uh, easy to find in the trade and are just wonderful wildlife plants. I'm a little biased towards shrubs when I'm talking about native plants just because I, and this is a, probably a gross generalization, but for the most part, shrubs seem to provide a little bit more than perhaps perennials do in terms of uh, benefits to wildlife. So a couple of those I've already alluded to. So, you know, of course, the, uh, the leaves are feeding, hopefully, some of our native insects in the larval form, and which in turn are going to feed up through the food chain, perhaps to birds and, and, and maybe mammals as well. But, uh, you know, then the flowers come out, you know, typically in uh, late spring, maybe early summer. So again, attracting tons of pollinators that are coming in, we're, we're feeding them and a whole different class of a group of organisms. And then again, in the fall or late summer, when the fruit comes out, uh, you know, we're, we're literally feeding probably droves of birds and, and small mammals and, and other critters that are coming to, uh, you know, feast on the bounty. So the other thing that I like about the, the dogwood group is the fact that I, in my mind, and I think, you know, with, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, using in the landscape, we can kind of divide them up into certain groups. So uh, like the gray dogwood that we have here, silky dogwood, and then the, uh, the, the red osier dogwood, uh, those are clump forming species that we typically find associated with wetlands. So, uh, you know, you plant what maybe just a stick to begin with and in a few years time, they have kind of these graceful arching branches that form a lot of structure, uh, which is the other thing that's wonderful about shrubs is that there's structure to their uh, presence in the landscape. So, you know, birds love to eat and hide and, you know, they always like to have these hidey holes. So, uh, you know, these species are wonderful because they form kind of like these nice almost rounded dense thickets that uh, provides a lot of uh, wildlife. So, you know, we have the, the uh, kind of a group of thicket forming, usually wetland associated species. And what's so wonderful about our native plants is most of these wetland species are pretty adaptable to growing in upland situations. So just because they may be considered obligate wetland plants in the wild, doesn't necessarily rule them out for growing in our more upland gardens. Uh, so that's a wonderful option there. And something to keep in mind when we're working with native plants is that, you know, there are some that are rather inflexible, not terribly adaptable, but then there's others that will kind of, they, it's like a, a happy dog. They, they just want to please, you know, <laughs> it seems like whenever you put them in, they'll do well. So, um, and then on the uh, lower corner here, we have 
uh, round leaf dogwood, which isn't terribly common in the trade, but it should be. Uh, that's an example of a thicket forming upland species that we typically find in, in usually really dry soils, um, often growing beside road uh, areas, uh, usually in the full shade. So uh, again, something that you're trying to get more into the horticultural trade and it's there, but sometimes you just have to dig. And as you can probably notice a theme on uh, most of these dogwoods here, uh, they have these really beautifully contrasting stems that the fruits attach to uh, on many of them, especially with round leaf dogwood and, and pagoda dogwood there. And even once the berries are gone, you have these striking often like coral pink or purpley type stems that uh, remain on there for quite a few weeks, um, not necessarily to the leaves fall off or, or pretty close to it. So one of my favorites and one of my childhood favorites before I even knew really what it was, was the uh, pagoda dogwood, also known as the alternate leaf dogwood and kind of a shorter lived uh, ecotonal species. I know where I grew up, I always found it kind of growing a little bit in the field, a little bit in the woods, but never completely in the woods and never completely in the field. So um, I kind of watch those come and go over the years. And, and, you know, it seems like they'll get multi-stemmed and maybe up to, you know, 10, 15, 20 years old. And uh, and then they usually contract some sort of a fungal disease if it's the form of the anthracnose and it kind of beats them back down. So uh, kind of an early successional, I'd say, plant. So And then we'll go kind of into a, another grouping. So you'll notice there's a lot of themes going on here. You know, we have the dogwood theme, which are in the genus Cornus, or, or most recently Sweeta. Uh, they've been proposed to be changed over to. And then now we're kind of going into the uh, rosaceous family theme, where um, a lot of these plant families, like especially here with uh, choke cherry, uh, you know, that's in the rose family. And when we see it in flower, it's pretty obvious that it's it, it kind of rose-like flowers that come down in these pendulous inflorescences. And we can kind of see that a little bit the way the uh, fruit structure is set up there. So uh, again, one of these plants that uh, now you see them, now you don't, when the fruit comes out, it, it goes really quickly, which tells me that it's, and it's an important food source. And of course you want them to disappear because that means they're being dispersed and you know the birds will fly away into a roosting spot and before long they poop them out and we're starting a new colony of, uh, of choke cherries to, to start a whole new area going. Oftentimes I find this associated with like these hedgerows. They're, they, they appear to be an ideal hedgerow type plant to get going. And uh, they're kind of a, a taller shrub with uh, multiple stems coming up. So not quite a tree, definitely a shrub, sometimes almost a tree. So it's one of those species there. So um, loamy soils, uh, part shade, take a little bit of sun, but uh, kind of hard to find in the trade. I've been working on getting this more, uh, kind of more of a relative plant, more in the conversation and I've only had mediocre luck with that. <laughs> Fire cherry. I kind of didn't really pay too much attention to this one for years, but uh, I would dare say that it's probably the, the prettiest in terms of the, the, the sheer volume of flowers that it produces. And as the name implies, it's an early successional species. Find it growing in kind of beat up areas, if you will, uh, parking lot turnarounds and uh, dry roadsides and such, but it has these really spectacular, you know, when we think of cherries, I mean, that we kind of think of those red cherries. I mean, they're quite small. They're maybe about 10 millimeters in diameter. And uh, again, those fly off the stem in short order. And uh, I try to put a lot of emphasis on these early, this different stages where we find these plants in the landscape. So you'll probably often hear me speaking of early successional. So, uh, you know, whenever a landscape is deserved, uh, disturbed rather in the natural world, uh, there has a tendency, there's certain groups of plants that will come in that have evolved to colonize quickly and rapidly take over an area in a good way, not in an invasive way as, as we're so used to now in battling. Uh, and oftentimes they're uh, making the area better than what they left it. So uh, plants like sweet fern have nit nitrogen fixing nodules in the roots. So they're actually adding nitrogen and helping that, that soil heal. So in fire cherry is an area that we, we typically would define that in as well. Beach plum is one of my favorites, uh, actually considered to be a rare plant in the state of Maine. Uh, the state of Maine has the so-called RTE list, which is rare, threatened, endangered species list. And that's based on the number of natural occurrences of a particular plant in question. So uh, Beach plum ranges from Nova Scotia, I believe, all the way down to the, certainly the Carolinas, if not beyond, but uh, it, 
there's some stands of it here in Wells and in other places, but I'm not sure if it's one of these plants that was always a little on the rare side. And now with rampant coastal development, that kind of put it over the edge. But uh, I was speaking with my son the other day, we were talking about how a lot of plants were, uh, even though we can't find them in the wild at all in some cases, or at least in uh, something like uh, beach plum, they're, they're harder and harder to find, but they're very secure in cultivation. Uh, so. I guess you know we'd rather see whether it be a plant or an animal in its native habitat, but if that native habitat is no longer there, then you know we have to go with Plan B. So very adaptable plant, despite the fact that you know we associate it with sand dunes and growing along coastal areas, usually in really bad soil, sandy, salty soil, um, you know, so-called hell strips, if you will, where where these just aren't uh, other plants are kind of struggling. But this does very well in upland areas too. So uh, garden loamy soils and. Uh, makes a la great landscape plant and attracts really just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pollinators, mostly the hymenopteran type pollinators. So like the winged uh, ants and wasps and flies and such. And uh, you know, I go out on a, on a sunny day and you just close your eyes and listen and it's just buzzing with such activity. So a wonderful landscape plant for, for pollinators. And oftentimes we don't usually think of shrubs when we're talking about pollinating, uh, you know, setting up plants for pollinators and such, but they definitely need to be part of the conversation. Of course, we have those delicious but tart uh, beach plums which can be made into all kinds of so-called value-added goods like jellies and such. Another plant that I often talk about is choke berry, not to be confused with choke cherry. Uh, again, both in the same family here, that's our theme, but uh, different genus, in this case, Aronia. And, uh, this is probably one of our most adaptable landscape plants. Uh, it can grow in wetlands. It can grow in sandy uplands, like on the Kennebunk Plains. You can find it, you can find it growing on mountaintops. I mean, you can literally almost find it growing anywhere. So uh, we can use this kind of to our advantage in planting in the landscape and uh, use it for a number of different applications. And because of its versatility, there's been a number of varieties with this that have been developed. Uh, but as we often see with varieties and native plants, this is a good example of kind of taking one thing and, and losing another. So, you know, in this case where we have some of these lower growing cultivars, uh, we notice that the flowers look a lot different, you know, to the point where uh, usually Aronia has these really beautiful white flowers. And, and with some of these cultivars, we notice the flower petals are greatly reduced and misshapen almost, but uh, we see with these plant genetics that uh, we can't have it all, you know, we, we can't have a compact habit, if you will, and still have normal looking flowers. So one has to ask, you know, these flowers, they look different, do they perform different ecologically? So that's something that we need to ask ourselves when we're looking at uh, varietal uh, native plants. So there's a lot of debate about it. And that, believe it or not, there's actually been, not to confuse the subject, but some varieties of native plants are shown to be more attractive to pollinators than the non-varietal type. So that just throws a complete wrench into the works. It just basically underscores the fact of how flexible and adaptive nature is. And uh, you know, don't judge a book by its cover sort of thing. But uh, typically I usually stay away from varieties just because there's a lot of unknowns about them. And uh, oftentimes there's a poor ecological fit. So um, you know, as the theme was when we first started, we need to start doing better in our landscapes. And that means kind of embracing this idea of these so-called wild type native plants. So. Maple leaf viburnum, which we talked about a little bit on the onset. And what I've always found interesting about this plant, and we see this in quite a few plants as well, is that you know the berries will come out, or the fruit rather, comes out at the fairly normal time, say in the fall sometimes. Then they just stay on the plant. They stay and stay and stay. And then, then they'll just disappear come maybe February or sometimes even March, all kind of shriveled up. It's like, okay, so what's going on here? Is it nobody is here to eat them? Is it because they're not palatable or, you know, so I read that there's a lot of fruits that almost have to mature for a while for tannins and certain other distasteful chemicals in the fruit to break down. And evidently the, the animals know because one day it's there, the next day it's, it's cleaned out. So it's kind of interesting. We have several other uh, species that we'll talk about that have kind of similar properties to that that I've always found interesting and uh, something that I think could definitely use some more research so just to find out what exactly is going on there. So, so a little spoonful of Ptolemyism here with the keystone uh, 
teach these concepts. So, uh, and it makes complete sense based on a lot of Doug's work that he's done, uh, showing that even though you know we, we want a, a diversified ecosystem and we want a diversified garden as well, but we're seeing now that there's just some plants that are more influential than others. And I guess in, in all parts of our life, you know, whether it's people or foods or what have you, there's always something that takes a little greater priority. So oak in particular is considered to be one of these keystone uh, species just because of it supports so many insect larvae, hundreds and hundreds of different species. And uh, it's, of course, oak is spread out over such a large area, uh, there isn't this, complete range of, of insects that follow it around. Each area has kind of its own host or, or uh, you know, diversity and community of insects that it supports. But, uh, you know, so it's certainly not, if it's 140 down in Delaware, it, it may not be that many, maybe more around here, we never know. So we certainly have to take that into consideration. The oak that I purposely chose here was bare oak or also called scrub oak and, and grows in uh, these kind of uh, glacial outwash plains, usually as an understory shrub as a shrub, which is kind of a cool thing. When you think of oak trees, you think of you know, big trees, you don't think of oak shrubs. And uh, you know, this particular species here has always caught my eye. And it seems to have more frequent mast years than some of our tree growing species do. So that's kind of a, an interesting part there. So that's why I chose this one in particular to illustrate that keystone species concept. You mentioned before, I'm always promoting the fact that shrubs are great pollinator plants. You know, when we say pollinator garden, what do we usually think of? We usually think of perennials. You know, we think of the uh, maybe cone flower or uh, mountain mint and things like that. But uh, I like to promote the fact that, you know, through observation that shrubs are awesome pollinators too, and are or pollinator plants rather. So, uh, you know, we definitely need to include them more in our uh, landscape planning. We see, I'm not very good at uh, insect identification, but it looks like a flower fly that's uh, attracted there. And it's really interesting too, because the uh, different flower types will attract different groups and different types of pollinators and uh, something that we need to pay attention to and we need to kind of integrate in our landscapes and plan for, uh, as we'll see later on in the presentation. Eastern tiger, tail, tiger swallowtail butterfly feeding on button bush. So uh, button bush is one of those great plants, typically a wetland plant, but very adaptable uh, to upland areas as well. And uh, the, of course, the spectacular beauty of the butterfly is kind of obscuring the beauty of the flower from the button bush, which is uh, seemingly a nearly perfect sphere. And it has these stamens kind of sticking up, which looks like a sort of a Sputnik looking sphere there, but a uh, wonderful plant and, and very adaptable and a great plant for those big showy butterflies. It has a really sweet, perfumey, narcissus-like smell to it as well. So, you know, if you happen to go along a pond edge or a vernal pool or a wetland or somewhere where it's in flower, uh, you'll smell it probably before you see it. So it's another positive uh, attribute to have in the landscape. So this is part of my pollinator garden right in the front of my yard. And I practice, try to practice what I preach. So I had a thin section of lawn there that I tore up and, uh, you know, a lot of these volunteered, especially with the golden rods, but uh, a lot of the other species like the New England aster I had to introduce. So, uh, and as you can see, there's a kind of a mixture there of native and non-native species. The uh, New England asters there on the uh, one corner and then the golden rods in the middle. And then uh, kind of on the, the lower corner there, you'll notice uh, some flocks, which is uh, something that my, my wife demands we have in our garden because it, it has a kind of a multi-generational significance to it from her grandmother. And, and, and again, Doug Tallamy often says, you know, you don't have to go rip out every single non-native plant in your yard. You want to plant as much native as possible, but 70% native, 30% non-native do no harm sort of plants. So it's not acceptable for something like barberry or Norway maple, which we all I'm sure know about. So, uh, you know, it's okay to have a little bit of both. We just have to uh, be wary of uh, who we invite in, I guess, if you will, so. And uh, purple coneflower, echinacea, uh, it is a native, but not a native to here. It's a native to the Midwestern United States. So, you know, that brings up some interesting conversation. It's like, okay, where do we draw the line on the so-called nativity? You know, do, do we have strictly plants that are in the, in the main area, New England, the eco region, the United States, east of the Mississippi River, you know, where do we draw these lines? So uh, I choose to include echinacea in my garden just because it's a beautiful plant. 
and it's a magnet for butterflies and I can't resist. So, you know, we have like an example here of these fritillaries. It's not uncommon to have multiple fritillaries at once fighting over landing space, which is awesome to see. And then, uh, you know, we, we have monarchs coming in and visiting and uh, those kind of diminutive skippers uh, that come in as several different species of those. So it really feeds an awful lot of wildlife. So a uh, big bang for the buck in terms of that plant there. New England aster is hard to beat in terms of its adaptability and uh, the kind of the riot of colors that it produces, everything from a great purple to a, a magenta to again, kind of like a coral red, really kind of versatile genetics there. So never really know what you're gonna get. And the painted lady butterflies really love it. And uh, American ladies as well, butterflies, which are quite closely related. And uh, both are migratory butterflies. And of course we all know about the migrations that monarchs do, but probably not so uh, up on other species of butterflies that uh, migrate, which is something that I learned a few years ago. I'm always researching and fact checking and double checking what I present to make sure you know I'm telling you, you know, accurate information and such. And uh, yeah, they're migratory butterflies as well. And you know they'll come in in the fall, and you know they might be there for a couple of days. And there's a, a gaggle of them, usually two or three, and then just poof, they're just gone. And uh, you know they too are migrating like the monarchs are. So. And of course, we don't have very many bird pollinators in this area, a uh, much more common trait in tropical areas. But around here, of course, we have our, our ruby-throated hummingbirds, and uh, they really like those deep corolla, corolla tubes on species like uh, cardinal flower here. You know, it's a very common experience to be going out and gardening all of a sudden here and, go, and you look around and you, know, you have this uh, hummingbird seemingly in hypersonic flight patterns buzzing around you and fighting. Who would have thought such a small bird would be so aggressive, but uh, you know, they, they like to compete for resources and, and uh, perhaps you need to when you're that small. So. so as we've spoken, native plants equal native insects. And we know this because of the, uh, these close associations that we see uh, with our native insects. And there's a, no a number of examples that we've probably been most taught about even as children, you know, particularly with monarch butterflies and uh, in the larval stage needing the, uh, the milkweed plant to be able to sustain that next generation. But uh, there's hundreds and hundreds, dare I say thousands of other of these associations uh, that you know, native insects have kind of co-evolved as a community with our native plants and overcoming various chemical defenses that the plants have. Uh, and, you know, being able to feed on them and, and reproduce, which is the ultimate goal. So it wasn't so long ago, as I often reflect upon that, you know, we, the first thing that we did when we put plants in was to make sure they were bug free. We wanted the bugs to stay off of them. You know, bugs were our enemies. And, you know, now we need to completely flip that generational idea over on its head. We need to feed the bugs. We're planting for invertebrate conservation, essentially, as like the Xerces Society would promote, and which I do in uh, many of my lectures as well. So, and you know, this is essentially bird food. We got some sawfly larvae munching away on pitch pine. And uh, if you ever get the chance to see sawfly, we have a number of different species of sawflies around here. They're kind of cool. Like there's one already that's kind of showing the defense posture. Uh, you can just like wave your hand across the, the feeding group. And they'll all kind of curl up and rear up on their backs. You take your hand away, they'll all come down and they kind of do it in unison too. And apparently it's a defensive mechanism to make themselves perhaps look bigger. Uh, again, these guys don't last too long when you find them. So I suspect that they're uh, pretty good on the bird food menu. Another species of sawfly, this time on pagoda dogwood. And uh, I don't care if they eat my plants, you know, that's what I have the plants there for. So, uh, you know, as probably deep down in our psyche, as soon as we see bugs eating plants, perhaps from millions of years ago or thousands of years ago, as we we're domesticating plants, you know, that, that was the last thing we'd want to see are bugs devastating our food sources. So we, we need to kind of like force that back. And it's okay for bugs to eat our plants now. We want them to because, you know, in this state, they're uh, bird food, and then, uh, you know, they'll, they'll metamorphosize and turn into flies, which will in turn, uh, you know, allow for some more types of uh, bird food for perhaps different species. The awesome spice bush swallowtail larvae. So uh, this was taken in uh, South Berwick. So it's local. And now for a long time, uh, spice bush swallowtail butterflies were, were kind of rare were they always here and we just didn't look for them or probably a combination of all these things. But you know, now there's a lot of 
uh, naturalists out there and uh, we're kind of watching out for these things and spectacular case of mimicry here. So, uh, you know, to look at this thing, it's like, what the hell is this? You know, is it, is it some sort of a snake? Is it some sort of escape reptile that, that, that's out here? No, we start looking at it. And of course, it's very much a caterpillar, but, you know, it has those devilish looking eyes that make it look so much bigger than what it does, kind of like the, the spot perhaps on a killer whale. And, you know, that's all basically to help ensure its survival. And uh, this is a specialist feeder. It's staged on spice bush and sassafras, both, both of which are kind of rare in this area, which would explain the rarity of the butterfly. So we have a kind of a cause and effect there. So in the next section we'll go into is going over planting and planning for pollinators, which as we find uh, is usually a couple different things. So there's a variety of, of different ideas we can look at here when we're planning for pollinators, we all know that we need to have a variety of bloom times and we need to be feeding them. And you know, at this point, very early spring, spring, summer, into fall until really it starts to uh, you know, get cold enough to prohibit insect flight. And of course, now with our climate change events that we're witnessing every year, uh, you know, a lot of these insects need food in November, which you know, maybe they maybe didn't years back. So we need to plan for that. We need to uh, figure in the diversity of flower shapes because pollinators have different tongue lengths. Makes sense, I guess they have different body forms. So uh, you know, just having a few species of flowers in our gardens will only invite in a few species of, of pollinators because of uh, the particular anatomy of these pollinators. So a uh, variety of plants, including trees, shrubs, and grasses. Trees play a really big role in uh, supporting our pollinators. Uh, plant and tender variety of habitats. You know, if we have a, a shady, moist area on our landscape, that's awesome. Plant it, you know, put in uh, appropriate plants for that area and take advantage of it. So this kind of exciting concept of larval host plants, which I've been kind of promoting throughout the season here. And that's something I've been learning about. And uh, again, something that we kind of know of from the monarch butterfly, but it extends out dramatically from there. So uh, organically grown plants started from seed are very important. Uh, we've all heard about the problems with systemic insecticides being used on plants. And the last thing we want to do is be killing the very organisms we're trying to promote, uh, which can happen. So uh, you know, there's a lot of locally grown native plants now, and they're we're a little hard to find, but if you dig, uh, it's well worth the effort. And uh, a lot of these great programs that have been initiated lately, like No Mo May, Leave the Leaves and such. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can uh, try to practically implement those into our landscape. So uh, I couldn't help this. I kind of went along a few weeks ago. Uh, we had a pileated woodpecker. There's this particularly utility pole by my house and it's old and it's hollow. So the woodpeckers of you know, the several different species that we have in the area, they love to just come in and wrap out their tune on it. And uh, it's always interesting. And I'd never seen a pileated up until a few weeks ago. So I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> but uh, you know, as we know that the dead trees and dead wood provides habitat and life for a lot of things, despite the fact that the plant itself is dead. And uh, we know that a lot of species of solitary bees need those soft materials to burrow in and overwinter in and make nests in and such. So, uh, you know, it's okay to have what we might consider a messy landscape because that messiness is providing opportunity for a lot of other organisms that, you know, we need to think about and, uh, and try to care for. And doing, research for this presentation and learn that 70% of native bees are ground nesting. Uh, so really important to have bare ground. And you know, we often say nature abhors a vacuum and humans abhor bare ground. And for good reason, in some cases, you know, with erosion and such, but uh, it's a very important habitat for our, uh, our native bee population and most of which are solitary nesters. And when we think of bees, what do we think of honeybees, right? And they're, they're, they form colonies and our, our native bees just not like that. They like to, you know, they probably come together to mate of course, but other than that, they just wanna be left alone. <laughs> That's such a bad thing, right? You know. And then, of course, you know the, the whole Leave the Leaves campaign, I'm sure a lot of us have uh, seen and, and, and talked about and hopefully implemented in our yards. And I kind of discovered this at a young age. I, uh, you know, when most kids were out riding their bikes and uh, you know, playing soccer or whatever, I, I was making a, a rock garden. So every year I dutifully pull, I get out there this time of year, pull off all the leaves and you know, kind of notice when I was doing it that uh, you know, that, that nice layer of organic matter is now gone and, and the moisture retention isn't what it should be. And 
And it didn't occur to me until quite some time later. Said, Leave the leaves. You know, it, it makes so much sense. But again, it's just kind of the classical gardening wisdom, right? You remove the dead material, you take the leaves off. And when in fact, we now know that leaves have so many positive properties to them. You know, we're, we're recycling the nutrients that the tree is converted, putting that back into the soil, providing habitat for hundreds of different species of uh, insects and um, you know, even things like salamanders and wood frogs, for instance, that need to overwinter in those upland areas away from their vernal pools. And of course, we've got woolly bully there that we all know and love in the fall. And uh, they need to have those areas to overwinter in. And uh, of course, most of us have maybe found them as we're digging through the soil early in the spring. So very important to leave those leaves. Well, I came across this, I was taking pictures uh, last year and uh, I said, wow, I never even thought of ants being pollinators. So that's why I kind of assumed, and you know, I watched them for a while. This is on a uh, Bebs willow, and it seemed like it was going to each flower very dutifully, collecting something. And so I did some research on it before the presentation, and I learned that for the most part, ants are typically referred to as pollen robbers. They're going in there, you know, they're, they're scoring a meal, they're hungry, they need to bring it back to the colony, they need to feed themselves. So come to find out, ant anatomy is not very conducive to pollinating. Of course, we know with insects, you know, they're, they're not going from flower to flower to pollinate. They're going from flower to flower to get nectar and pollen and feed themselves. And in the process, they're pollinating just because of these setae or, or densely hairy bodies which trap the pollen. And then as they're uh, scurrying through other flowers, they're, they're pollinating and, and, and making the, the, the match there. So. Uh, Ants have evidently antibiotic type uh, chemicals that are on their skin that help them live in their colonies where there's usually a high moisture content. And of course, many species of ants are, are, are fungal farmers. So I didn't realize they had antibiotics drenched on their body. So that in turn evidently has a, a negative effect on pollen. So even if there is some pollen stuck to their body, chances are it's not gonna be uh, alive enough so when they go to their next house, so pollination won't occur. And of course, as you know, ants aren't very hairy. So fun things that we learn. So the importance of larval host plants, and uh, you know, again, we know the, the whole part about the monarch butterfly, but most every species of butterfly and moth has a larval host plant. And in some of those cases, they're very specific. In other cases, they're generalist. So I chose to use this case with a fritillary just because it, it visits me quite often. And uh, come to find out the, even though the adults we find attracted to like Echinacea and other asteraceous plants, uh, they need violets in order to complete their life cycle. So, uh, you know, when the time is right, they'll come in and they'll either lay their eggs on the violets or close by. And then as the larvae hatch out, they find their way to the violets, they'll eat and get to the point where they can metamorphosize to their next form uh, sometimes multiple instars or stages. And then other times, uh, you know, they're jumping right from the worm, basically the, the creepy worm form to the moth or butterfly that we are so familiar with. So, uh, you know, when we're seeing these butterflies flying through our neighborhoods, there's a reason why they're there. And conversely, there's a reason why they may not be there. So, if, you know, their adult feeding plants are there, that's one thing. But if their larval host plants are there, it makes complete sense that they wouldn't be there either. So. Again, going back to that awesome spice with swallowtail caterpillar. And, uh, you know, we often find it growing on spice bush. Uh, and spice bush in itself is a really important wildlife plant. Those, I don't know if, if anybody's ever tried to, like, say, propagate spice bush from seeds, you'll notice that the, the seeds are really very obviously fatty and slippery and, and kind of hard to work with. So, come to find out they're rich in lipids, which of course is sustained energy in the fall for bird migration. So again, we, we kind of see like this full circle of important features there. Uh, we can see on the, the lower corner there in, in flower, that was in Pennsylvania a few weeks ago. Of course, they're a few weeks ahead of us, but well, this is a cool thing. So there's a couple species of carnivorous butterfly larvae. So the harvester butterfly, which I fact checked and indeed its range extends up into Maine, uh, the larvae feed on woolly aphids, apparently woolly aphids that grow on alders. So that's another example of, again, the importance, whether we even are doing it intentionally or know it or not, of having diverse species assemblages, either in our gardens or promoting them nearby, because you know, who would have ever thought that uh, you would have you know, a carnivorous butterfly larvae? It almost sounds like maybe something out of a horror movie of sorts, you know, but uh, it's, it's true. And it, it's kind of a great example of the importance of diversity and how we need to embrace it and have that in our landscapes. 
I love staghorn sumac. Most people fight staghorn sumac like it's a you know, World War III because it, again, it's very um, adventurous. You know, we, we find it growing again in some of these disturbed areas where uh, maybe many other things aren't growing. And, you know, it's like, a, you know, the, the, the gopher game where, you know, it pops up in one spot, we may take that up, pops up in another. And that's what it does. It's a colonizing plant. It get, thrives in these disturbed areas. So we should be grateful that it's a, a kind of a healing plant in terms of, of trying to make do with a landscape that's been damaged. And uh, another thing that we can be grateful for is the, the flowers there in the middle frame where uh, not a terribly pretty floral display, you know, there's male and female plants and uh, around midsummer, so we had these kind of pale green yellowish flowers that come out, but densely flowered. And again, they attract a lot of pollinators. Uh, usually it seems like, again, those kind of winged ants or, or wasps and such. And it's also the uh, larval host plant for the spring azure butterfly. Spring azure butterfly does come into this range, but it's nothing that we would come across even if we were actively seeking it out. So we're, I think we're on the edge of that range. But again, I just used it as an illustration. So I couldn't help myself. I had to show it again in a different picture. Uh, you know, the fact that the, the importance to birds on this one too is something I like to emphasize because the, the fruit stays on, if you've noticed like well, in, the, the leaves are off. You know, we got the first snowfall, they're still on, we're into, you know, December, January, February, March, and what the heck is there around it in February, March to eat for a bird? Well, this is available. And usually, again, it's just everything happens suddenly in nature. It seems like a lot of times, you know, one day they're, they're nice and loaded up with these, this fruit, and then the next day, uh, it, it's, it's like a skirmish occurred, and pieces are on the ground, and, and the, the branches are bare. So, uh, again, another important late winter food source for birds. Same thing with winterberry to a certain extent where the berries will not stay on as long as they do with something like sumac, but they'll usually stay on well into the winter months. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we like it as a landscape plant uh, because it, it does have a kind of that multi-season interest and you know, it might be kind of a bland, dull, drab landscape. But we have these nice bright red berries. So uh, I'm gonna digress a little bit here because there's some fun stories about winterberries. So winter, we we're talking about the, the potential problems with some of these varietal plants. This is a really interesting juxtaposition on this species. So uh, there's several varieties that are recognized and are bred for the fact that they have these much bigger berries than what we typically find, because the berries on a, a wild type plant sometimes may not be much bigger than maybe a BB or, or a bit bigger than that. So there's been some studies that have shown that in these large berry varieties, the berries are too big for the target bird species to swallow. So again, we're kind of selfishly playing. We're, we're planting native, right? Yeah, but you know, we're come to find out some birds that are typically used to eating these can't use them as a food source. So the other part of this equation is, as many species of hollies are, you have male and female plants. Who wants to put a male plant in their landscape because it's not gonna have these pretty berries, right? So how do we get around this? We did, and it's not 50-50 in nature. Like if you planted 100 seeds, you're not gonna have 50 females or 50 males. It's much more skewed towards the males. And if, you know, we often see fewer females in comparison. So how do we deal with this in a landscape? We wanna have this plant in our landscape, but we wanna have our cake and eat it too. So the, a lot of the varieties with this particular species have been separated out on male and female varieties. So what do you do with that? You know? You, had, you want the berries, but you don't want your varieties because the varieties aren't seed propagated, of course, they're, they're vegetatively propagated. Roll the dice. A lot of people don't want to do that. They want to be pretty well assured of success of having red berries. So it's kind of an interesting issue. And there's a lot of species that are like that. Uh, spice bush, for example, male and female plants, you want to plant it for the berries, you may or may not get any. You know, we get kind of a, a, a not quite a 50 50 a roll of the dice, if you will. And there's several other species too. Bayberry is like that. You know, people are excited. Oh, I, you know, I want to, it's our bayberry recipe. I want to try to make wax candles. Are these going to be female plants? I don't know. It would be nice to know. I would love to be able to tell you, but you just don't know. Nothing's been done with like bayberry in terms of separating the mountain varieties, but I digress on purpose here just to illustrate some of the conundrums that we often face in native plant. Uh, nursery trade and, and trying to you know do the right thing by 
non-varietal plants, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's complicated. Some plants are easier than others, but it's complicated. So, uh, and of course, it, pointing out with a whole larval host plant theme with Henry's elfin butterfly, which in fact does exist around here. Looking at sassafras, which is kind of at the northern end of its range here, we have some stands in, in the Sanford area. And again, it seems to be kind of a, a hedge row favoring species. We find it kind of in ecotonal areas, a little bit more common when we get down into the Berwicks and Kittery. And then uh, when we get down into like the Durham, New Hampshire, uh, coastal area, it becomes even more common in the further south we go. So we're definitely at the northern tip of its range. Again, like we would expect, uh, it's part of the spice bush family. So it has those really uh, lipid rich kind of fatty fruit that come out in the fall and uh, you know, great for migrating birds. And of course I had to throw in the larval uh, picture again, it's just such a spectacular uh, picture. This was actually taken not far from here, just a, maybe a thousand feet out in the woods and uh, it's Washington hawthorn, which um, should be more common in the nursery trade. We have about 25 species of it in Maine. As a genus, there are hundreds and hundreds of species of it and kind of has these pretty white flowers that will be coming out in a few weeks and uh, has this fruit that comes out and uh, sure as heck as we would expect, it's a larval host plant for something. Uh, in this case, the, the red spotted purple, which is neither red spotted or purple, but I, I digress there. So <laughs> I'll just stick with the plants and be judgmental on the plants. We'll, we'll let the other folks worry about the butterflies. So, uh, and then I'm, I'm always trying to promote new ways of thinking and kind of diverging out new pathways. And uh, I like to, Look at the grasses as well. You know, grasses are included in our landscapes. It, you know, most of the time, it's non-native, uh, sometimes invasive grasses. So we have little blue stem grass, which I'm sure you could find within five feet from here. Very common in these areas. Uh, loves upland areas with poor soils, low nutrient composition, fast draining soils. Um, doesn't take much for water when it, it gets going. And uh, grasses are split up into warm season and cold season grasses. As the name implies, the cold season grasses gets going earlier in the season. The warm season grasses don't get going until usually like late June or July. So if I were to you know, offer you a pot of this, it, it'd be basically just this brown grassy stem of nothing. But uh, you know, sure as heck, if the plant is alive, it will come to again in, in July. So there's this kind of interesting dichotomy between our native grasses that, that kind of fit both ends of the spectrum. So and um, you don't often think of this as having anything to do with pollinators because it's wind pollinated as most grass species are. But lo and behold, nine species of skipper butterflies use it as a larval host plant. And I was also reading as well that it, it makes it important habitat for ground nesting bees because of all kind of the, the nooks and crannies and the hidey holes that it forms. And uh, oftentimes when we see it growing in the wild, uh, it does have these uh, kind of clump forming tendencies. It doesn't have rhizomatous growth like we often associate with plants. So. Again, you know, we have the skipper butterfly on the echinacea down there in the corner. And the reason why we have the skipper butterflies is because we have our little blue stems around. So, and of course that famous poster child of larval interactions with uh, milkweed. So uh, it's cool enough that it's the food source for monarch butterflies. If you take a few minutes and just kind of sit there and watch a nice grove of uh, common milkweed. It attracts an awesome variety of kind of freaky looking pollinators. Uh, you know, we have this hummingbird moth that's coming in and, and then uh, off to the side there, we have those, uh, I think they're, I believe they're milkweed beetles that appear to be mating or, or having some sort of a, a fight there, but uh, there's species of, of beetles that will actually go through and instead of, uh, you know, maybe figuring out a way to, to deal with the chemicals in the sap, what they do is they sever the veins on the leaves and by doing that, that allows the sap to drain out. And then after that's drained out, then they'll go in and feed on the leaves. So that's a really cool way. That's a splendid example of, of close uh, co-evolution between uh, you know, completely different species, insects in the animal kingdom, and of course, milkweeds in the plant kingdom. So, and then we have turtle head, which is a, a pretty common plant in kind of wet mucky areas, often stream side or wetland side. Uh, and come to find out, of course, it's the uh, larval host plant for the Baltimore checker spot. So, and I included this as well, just to show the diversity of, you know, of, of, of native plants and where they'll grow, but also, you know, it has kind of a funky looking floral shape to it too. And of course the namesake turtle head is its resemblance to a turtle and it's taken even further uh, where the, the genus and the scientific name is Chalone. 
and Chelonia is an order of turtles. So that's kind of cool. So that uh, you know the, the Latin names are doing their jobs and being descriptors of of what it looks like or, or its resemblance to other organisms. And then pokeweed, which is a kind of a common weed of disturbed areas, and uh, again it looks it, it's almost shrub like these so called suffrescent stems, which are uh, kind of woody but still definitely perennial. So it's kind of one of those in between plants and. Uh, kind of ancient looking flowers. In fact, the, the family and the order that this plant belongs to is considered to be a, a so-called primitive plant family, primitive in the fact that it has uh, traits associated with uh, you know, a lineage of plants that were uh, you know, way, way back. And uh, so it's kind of unique in that way. It's kind of a little bit of a throwback of sorts, but uh, when the berries come out in late summer and fall, uh, the bluebirds and uh, catbirds and a variety of other birds will come in and, and feast on these. And I've seen these caterpillars crawling around like mad in the fall and never really knew what they were. And they're very distinctive. They have these coarse hairs that come out, but then uh, kind of in the ribbing between the segments, they're very bright red. Um, so they stick out like a sore thumb and, and come to find out they, uh, you know, they're the, the larvae of the giant leopard moth which in itself, it looks a little bit more like a Dalmatian to me, but we don't split hairs. So uh, again, kind of a perfect example of a plant that, you know, our, our first inclination would be to, to get it out of there so we could put something else in, but uh, you know, it's, it's a native plant, Phytolacca americana. So it's, it's right in a specific epithet. So uh, again, a little bit of research goes a long ways and get into interesting phytochemistry as well. Uh, I guess a, a barrier once in a while won't hurt you, but there are some poisonous parts of the plant. So it's, it's interesting there as well. <laughs> I like to be more like it. It's almost more saleable that way. So I found out some great information about foam flower, which is very common in the horticultural trade, usually as varieties. Are very, evidently a very plastic genome, because as you well know, the, the leaves on this come in seems like dozens, if not maybe hundreds of different shades and patterns, but uh, try to find the, the wild type non-varietal foam flower. It's really hard. It's very ironic because you'd, you'd have a hard time finding this, but yet you can go to any garden center, whether it's Walmart or the local garden center down the street or another big box store, and you're going to find it. It's just not the, the, the native type. So uh, come to find out for such a kind of a modest plant, it supports an awful lot of, of, of butterflies. So morning cloaks, which are coming out now, I've seen two or three of them already. Uh, they're unique in the fact that they overwinter as adults, uh, which is kind of rare when it comes to butterflies and moths, not uncommon, but a little on the rare side. And that's a, one on the top there with the, the brilliant um, white margins on its wings. And, and then we get into the Eastern commas and the question marks. And, I don't think there's any exclamation points, but uh, uh, yeah, those kind of interesting species there that again, use foam flower as a larval host plant. In the wild, we find uh, foam flower usually growing kind of wet, mucky wetland soils, always in the shade. But as we know, it's very adaptable and more upland uh, gardens, it does quite well. And then these silver spotted skippers that I found coming to my Akination Again, I didn't really give it too much thought. And then as I was doing research, it's like, okay, so I, we see the theme here, turn into a broken record. It's got to have a larval host plant. So it turns out that it's American groundnut, which is kind of an interesting plant. It, it, you can see that when the, the flowers, it has that resemblance to, to peas. So it, it's in the Fabaceae family. And uh, the, as its name implies, the groundnuts are edible. And we often hear stories of the uh, early colonizers and occupiers, if you will, coming over and uh, making use of that. and, and uh, as a food source. So I could go on forever, but this is probably a good place to end it now. We hit our hour point. So uh, questions or comments? I mean, certainly have a question and answer session now. And, uh, you know, if it, uh, driving home or a couple of days later, you have some other questions, you can contact me in you know, multiple ways, either by phone, email, or uh, poke around on the website. And there's more contact information there. So, first of all, great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> about non-native insects. Um, so the bane of my life for many years has been Japanese beetles. And do they have anything good to recommend them? Um, are they food for anything? Do, are, you know, I'll, I, I just drop them in water and kill them. And, yeah. you know, I, I just 
I think from what I've observed and read in their larval form they are, because oftentimes there's this, skunks. exactly. Yeah, skunks coming in. The skunks are digging up my lawn. You know, you, you got to treat the lawn for grubs, which will in turn, you know, hold, and there are actually some, some biological treatments that you can use for yeah, Japanese, yeah. yeah. A milky spore, I believe it is. So I can't say that I've ever seen an adult Japanese beetle be eaten by anything. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah, yeah spiders, crack grapples, and crows are three things I've seen. That's okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad. I had to watch it for years, too. Very feeding them to the It's nothing. Yeah. And I eat crows and I put them in peanuts and they ate them. Oh, nice. Cool. Oh, cool. Oh, oh, cool. Oh, maybe they'll tell you more. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they could be an excellent protein source like ants or other bugs, who knows? But, uh, so, any other questions or ideas or comments? Or? Yep. So, when you're planting native plant and growing, you know, seedling, when you, when you put them out in your yard, do you put a lot of manure with them or compost, or you, how does that work? So, it depends on the species of plant that you're working with. So, off on a little tangent here. So if you have something like we just looked at with little blue stem, definitely not. You want to actually put it in some of the more poor soil that you may have available on your property. It doesn't, it's, it's been adapted to these nutrient poor environments for millennia. So it needs sandy quick draining soils with low nutrient value, uh, you know, with, with good drainage. So, but then if you get into something like some of these wetland perennials that we we're talking about, something like maybe Joe pieweed or bone set, where you know they're used to growing in more moist conditions, having an added organic matter content to these more maybe upland loamy soils will definitely benefit them. Because of course, with organic matter, you have moisture retention. So that will kind of help compensate for maybe for that loss of adequate moisture that it may have evolved in in, in more of a wetland condition. So it definitely, matters on what plant you're talking about. It's not like our vegetable gardens, you know, we've all been trained, you want to enrich that soil and make it the best soil you can because, you know, with more fertility come bigger yields and, and better flowers or fruit or vegetables or whatever we're trying to grow. But, you know, with native plants, it isn't always like that. There, you know, there's some that really enjoy that extra organic matter. And then there's some that it will literally kill. I've seen a couple examples of uh, well-intentioned native plants installed in a garden but then laying down high test compost, if you will, and drip irrigation. Why did this fail? Not wrong plant, wrong place. You know, lay off the the organic content of the soil. You know, yes, you need a little bit of extra water to get the plants established. But then after that, turn it off. You know, kind of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of part of that whole right plant, right place situation. I know we can't research the daylights out of every plant that we see or, or especially on the spot, but they're, they're definitely picky, so. Yeah. Um, last year, we went to the Audubon native plant sale. Yeah. Which was great fun. Yeah. But it's really difficult. You wanna buy six should we just get one plant and test it and then next year get more? Yeah. You know, it's a lot of decision making. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I even didn't succeed with Joe Pryor, which you know, we find growing a lot besides the road. I put it in the garden and it's not happening. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it seems much more complicated. I, I love the idea, but. Um, see why people who just want to have a pretty flower garden just go for the traditional stuff. Yeah, there's, you know, I think a lot of native plants have an undeserved reputation as being difficult. And elderberry is something that I've had difficulties with over the years. You know, you, you do your research on it, so it needs, you know, likes to have these kind of loamy organic soils with uh, higher moisture content than maybe some other shrubs. And, a little bit of shade, a little bit of sun, you put it there and it just withers away to nothing. So, you know, some of it may have to do with like the plant stock itself, uh, transplant shock sometimes, you know, you're coming out of this cushy nursery environment and, you know, being tended to fairly regularly and then you're kind of going out on your own, um, you know, especially with these erratic rain uh, events that we have during the summer, uh, you know, like right now it's really dry and, and it could be dry for 
much of the summer, or it could, you know, we could have deluges of rain. So you know, maybe establishment that, you know, even though they're, they're native plants and they're adapted to the area, perhaps much better than a lot of other plants, sometimes they need extra TLC. So it could have been, you know, a whole variety of things. And sometimes it's just simply not the right plant for the right place. Uh, if we can catch it in time, we can maybe, you know, put it into a different area that you know, try it out if that doesn't work. But so it, it's kind of touch and go. And um, a lot of the species that are available in the trade are, are easier to grow more adaptable species. You know, they're in the trade for a reason. And you see that more so with like uh, commercially available non-native plants. You know, they're, they're easy to propagate. They're, um, they're easy to transport. They, they, do, they do well in a variety of areas. So um, yeah, just keep on trying. And uh, that, like, you know, all things with gardening, there will be some failures, but it's that, you know, like, like with salesmanship, you know, every lost sale, you're closer to, to making your sales. It's kind of the same with, with plants. So. Well, I'll never look at violets the same way. Oh, good. I tend to think of them as being uh, weeds in the sense that they grow where I don't want them to be. Very. But now that I know they're a host plant. Yeah. So Leave a few extra in there, but yeah, they, they do get a little rascally in the dark, for sure. So, well, thank you very much, Sean. Very welcome. It's my pleasure.